Good evening, everybody. Uh, Scott Stevens here with another perspective. The twice a week show I do where we get to venture just a little bit out of the weather zone, sometimes a lot, but into topics that uh, I find interesting, relevant, and probably would have been ones that I would have really enjoyed doing had I been in more long form journalism uh, at the time. All right, uh, not going to show up on YouTube today, it looks like, as uh, we're uh, getting that alert over there. Just FYI, mostly just for me. But uh, nonetheless, as we approach a second round of COVID, the issues that were so paramount in everybody's hearts and minds the first time last March, last spring, when we went through COVID, was food. Food, food, food. The other was, where do I get a paycheck? What happens with that? You know, if I can't go to work, either A, because I can't get, get gas or my workplace just isn't open, how do I feed myself? How do I feed the family? Those issues, as we approach the second potential locking down, and I, I'm not going to say a second lockdown is going to happen, but a lot of governments are already beginning to do that. So are people prepared to stay inside? Now, we've just begun the cool season. It's just fall in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're coming out of winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're still seeing locations like Australia locking people down, even though we should feel freer to go out and about as the weather warms up. We get more vitamin D with the sunshine, and we can naturally have greater distance between one another because of the better weather conditions. So. Mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, as we do go into winter, we're already seeing Spain, Italy, England, the states with near or at record high cases of COVID. We're seeing a bit of an increase in those deaths, but not to the extent that we did last last spring, probably because the medical establishment is simply in a better place to contend with what faces them. So I want to hit food mostly. I think that's uh, kind of the big one. And it is the one thing that you and I can immediately prepare for, provided we have the resources to go to the grocery store, to get to the grocery store. These things may not be uh, available. There's so many people that have to go to the weekly food bank. And that is sad and unnecessary, but that's the way it is. Even here in this small town where I am in Colorado, commodities in the food bank Monday or uh, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, they've never been as busy. So what we need to have is a continuation of those supplies to the food banks so that we can go through this winter and uh, and, and get through winter and healthy. Uh, Ryan's asking, do I believe in the case counts? Yes and no. Yet there's a reason these people have been tested. Now, because we don't have a specific test, a PCR test for COVID, one simply doesn't exist. That brings, yeah, exactly, that brings in the debate as to whether we're actually getting positives for COVID. And the one test that I I think is fascinating is that the state side is the cases of flu this year versus last year. They're almost I can't say almost no, but there are far fewer flu cases this year versus last year, while the COVID cases continue to climb. So it is a it is an interesting dichotomy, or let's just say a shuffling of cases from one category and into another. I'm sure there are medical professionals that we I, I should get on the show so we can discuss this uh, as we move from October to November, and certainly as the weather gets colder and colder in the weeks ahead. Let's pop into this because uh, we've got issues. I'm going to call the show Food Fights, the scramble for supply. The food supply is finite. We've got fall, stateside, You know, what's coming in from the fields is going to come in from the fields. Now, the question is, can we keep what is in the fields in the supply chain? Or are we going to see issues that interrupt the transit from the farmer's bins to the the co-op silos to the processor to to, from then out back into the grocery store as we uh, see the end consumer? So this is where we're going to see a lot of places where we could see interruptions. All right, there's how you connect with me uh, through Metadon Digital through uh, Twitter, through Facebook and Instagram, and ultimately a website, scottstevens.co. All right. 
As governments globally continue to threaten their respective populations with a second, even more draconian lockdown to battle COVID, weaknesses in the global supply chains have once again come into focus. We can live without toilet paper, but we cannot live without food. Billions of pounds of food are consumed daily, and nearly each and every one of those pounds of food must be moved from farm to table. It appears as, as, as winter approaches, it would behoove each and every one of us to the best of our ability to secure the daily necessities before the second rush to the supermarket grips the planet. We all remember those Costco lines that happened last spring. The time to get ready is always now. <clears throat> so I see the primary causes of the food system failures that ultimately and may result in famine. This has happened time and time again across the planet. War, that's the big one. More people are driven to famine, driven to hunger, driven to extreme weight loss and weakness and fragility because of war. One has been nearly threatened. In fact, uh, this is a quote I, I just passed my mind. Uh, uh, Xi, si, the president of, of China, alerting his citizens to stock up for months. He knows, they know, that some global issue focused around China is imminent. Is it with Taiwan? Is it with the states? Is it with Vietnam? Is it with India? Or might it even be Russia, since Russia is stockpiling military assets on their southern border with northern China. So there have been some pre-positionings of assets that more than likely will result in some kind of kinetic event. Now, in this list, war, kinetic, trade, monetary, or economic sanctions. We've been dealing with a trade war with China. And monetary and economic um, economic sanctions have been happening with the Chinese as well as as well as Iran, portions of Iraq, and even Russian uh, Russian citizens or those in the hierarchy of Russia, uh, dealing with the Nord Stream two uh, pipeline. So this war issue is up there. And as we go through a list of famines, you'll be amazed at how often war is the primary cause of the issue. The other one is currency collapse as trade partners become unwilling to exchange in the case of Venezuela or Iran or North Korea or Japan in the early 40s and late 30s or Germany in the 20s. The exchange of that sovereign currency for hard goods and hard assets. They really want to do trade in another hard asset. If we're trading wheat for oil, kind of a fair exchange or wheat for gold. Also, a hard asset that will maintain its value outside of a currency printed by the nation's central bank. And as a result, when these other things happen, disease often shows up on the scene. Now, right now we're seeing locusts, insects, and part of me thinks that it wasn't as big a deal uh, as it ended up being. We had the big locust uh, through Africa uh, last uh, last January and February as they had incredible rains through that continent and those spread into Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, and then eventually over to parts of China. But it does seem like por a portion of that was managed. However, what I'm not aware of, and maybe it isn't necessarily public or it just hasn't come across my, my screen yet, is the impact of that insect invasion, those locusts, on the food supply. And maybe now that those eggs have been laid by those insects, next year is the one that that spread, that swarm, will finally come to a truly, truly menacing conclusion. All right, weather and climate changes. We've seen the droughts uh, in, in parts of the states, drought also in China, but the floods have been widespread in many, many locations, and that impacting primarily Chinese and Vietnamese and Laotian rice production. Rice containing 11 million calories per ton versus 4 million for wheat. So rice is a far more caloric dense product. And you would, uh, if you had to choose in feeding your population rice or wheat, rice would be the uh, leader's choice. Uh, frost and heat stresses. Uh, the frost 
uh, certainly impacted South America over the, these last two months as they really dealt with a long, long winter. And now drought in Brazil is hampering the production or the, even the spring planting of soybeans. Those That planting has not even begun, even though now we're deep, deep, deep into April. And that crop has not been planted because of drought. Geophysical and natural disasters, earthquake, volcano, tsunamis, and interruption to transportations, sabotage. A fascinating story. If you were to truly begin to look at some of the food issues that are showing up, sabotage is is pinging the attention. Logistics failure. We saw that with COVID. COVID and logistics are almost going to go hand in hand. And then greed, number eight, are simply a failure to learn and implement lessons from the past. Uh, it didn't load, really, guys. Let's try anyway, just to see, just to see. Nope, nope, guess that's not going to be there. All right, so I want to look at uh, how many meals do Americans consume? Uh, the American population, right, about 330 million. And let's just say we eat two and a quarter times a day because I eat once a day. And I know some people that eat every two, three, four hours because they believe that's healthier for them. That's not within the range of this discussion, but let's just use a number because I'm after ounces or pounds of food consumed. So if we eat two and a quarter times a day, that is almost 750 million meals daily. Now, over the course of a month, take that number times 30, that's 2.275 billion meals every single month that Americans consume. Or if a monthly requirement of 28 billion pounds of food, if one meal weighs a pound and a quarter, or say 20 ounces, some eat vastly more than that, and others less, especially the young to a point. But once we get to four, five, six years old, we all remember that appetite. We could eat and eat and eat. They didn't seem to put on any weight. So globally, if we take that out across 7.7 billion people, that is 650 billion pounds of food monthly, monthly, just not. And in two months, we're at 1.2 trillion pounds of food. That is a lot of food. Okay, that isn't going to load. And that is an unacceptable option for me. So. All right. Uh, yeah. Control, control oil. This from Henry Kissinger, who's still alive and still advising world leaders on things. So control oil and you control nations, control food, and you control the people. That is simply how important uh, food is to, to the population. All right. Let's see if we can't start there. Negative. Okay. This is going to be a challenge then. Uh, what I'm after is... Where and who controls and who supplies these billions of pounds of food that we consume? What I'm after is vegetables. Up here in this corner, I'm going to go full screen just so that works. Come here just to get a little bit bigger. All right, vegetables, lettuce and chicory. Who produces the most? The Philippines with Chinese in third place. Lentils, Canada. Dry beans, India. Onions, dry onions, China. The U.S. is in fourth place. Cabbage, China. Green beans, China. With U.S. not even in the top four. Green peas, China. U.S. in third place. Chickpeas, India, Australia, Miramar, Ethiopia. Uh, Cauliflowers and broccoli, China and India. States is in third place. Eggplant, China. Potatoes, China with the U.S. in in fifth place. Uh, Spinach, China with the states in second place. Soybeans, Brazil with the United States in second place with China in fourth place. Carrots, China. Cucumbers, China. We begin to get a flavor of just how global the production of food is. So we have need to examine where the United States falls in each of these categories and ask, can we feed ourselves without global trade? Is that even possible? We go to fruits, apricots, Turkey, the number one producer, olives, Spain, pears, China, United States in second place, bananas, India, then Brazil, and then China, mangoes, mangosteen, guava, India, then China, then Thailand, coconuts, Indonesia, then the Philippines, uh, figs, Turkey, then Egypt, grapes, China, then Italy, oranges, Brazil, then China, United States is in fifth, in fourth place, papaya, uh, Brazil, and then India, peaches, China, Italy, Greece, Spain, and Turkey. We're not even in the top five apples, then China. 
And then the U.S. is in, in second place. Pineapples, Costa Rica, Brazil, then the Philippines. So if we look down this list, the United States, except for maybe cherries in second place after Turkey for, for cherries, we're not in the top position. So we have surrendered a massive portion of our ability to grow food offshore. Offshore, and then we trust that we continue a good relationship and then have something to trade with them to bring that end product, that finished good, back stateside. We go to meat. Who doesn't want a little meat with at least one of their meals? Uh, granted, there's vegetarians out there, and there's a huge, huge push by the UN and the group that are pushing sustainability because of global warming reasons to go meatless to go vegan. And as we look, even as we started with, with fruits and vegetables and grains, a lot of that happens offshore. We go to meat. First producer, chicken is Brazil. Beef, Brazil, United States in, in second place. Pork, China, then the U.S. Sheep, China, then Australia. Goat, China, then India. Turkey, U.S., then Brazil. And duck, China, then France, Malaysia, Myanmar, and then Vietnam. So we don't find, well, we're, we're in second place for chicken, beef, and pork, and that's just as well. How much of that, though, stays stateside? And apparently... A lot of it goes overseas, and we're not necessarily hungry. If you look at us, we're, we're a well-fed population. So the number one cause of food system failure resulting in famine. Let's come back here and see that. Uh, we go through the list. Maybe I'll just need to keep this large because we see, and yes, Michelle, this is kind of a big thing. We have to learn the responsibility of growing our own two generations ago and certainly three and four generations ago, we had a job, a trade, and we had, a, a, shall we say, it, a farm. We had a garden. And I grew up in a household where mom, with our help, we canned every single July and August. Cherries came on first, first week of July, off to Utah. And those cherries were picked. They came back home. We either, we either canned them or we froze them and then peaches, then apricots, then pears, and then our garden was ready in August. And this is something, these are skills. These are even, where does that come from? That is missing. We have become so lost in where burgers come from, that it comes from many different sources to put a burger together. You know, where does this, where does that, that information is lost. And there's this, this generation right now is going to get a crash course on food and food sources and the importance of. These are the famines. And time after time after time, most of it ends up coming from war. That seems to be the big one is war. The other one, war, kinetic trade, monetary, economic war resulting in sanctions. That's a long, long list. And just notice how many of these occurrences have been triggered by war so often in Africa, where some of it is tribal and some of it is instigated by the imperial powers, antagon antagonizing one against the other. So what may have been the local generational source or, or of power has been superseded by the colonial power because they can instill a crooked government, that that crooked government will then offshore the profits, be they mineral rights, be they oil rights, be they whatever is of desire by that banking family. And that has been the curse of the generations. All right. The other one is a currency collapse triggered by sanctions resulting in available money chasing hard goods. And this is the source of, of ultimately of, of inflation. We have, what if we were all to get a stimulus check of $100,000? More than a year's income for most people, $100,000. What would you do with $100,000 or even a million dollars? If we're going to print money, let's just do a million dollars. What would you do with it? What would you spend it on? Just the necessities, or would you go out and chase that desired object that you would never have purchased otherwise? The house, the nice car. All of a sudden, many, many people are out there bidding for that object of desire. And then the cost of that object of desire goes up. When that object of desire is rice, is bread, 
is milk, is oil to keep the car going or the house warm, then we begin to see that value of that object going up, not because oil is any more than it was 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago, but because there's a line of people chasing it because it is needed. All right. And that's how inflation gets going. The other third one is primary causes of food system failure resulting in famine is disease. Disease brought on by insects that we talked about earlier on. Livestock, China, I believe it's upwards of 70% of their pork is gone because of the swine flu. 100% fatal when the herd gets it. So you've got to cull the infected animals from, from spreading it to the remainder of the herd. If your herd is wiped out, then you have lost the income. You have lost your livelihood. And now you're on the street with your hand out asking for donations. Disease, insect, lime socks, plants, blight, mildew, and diseases, are, and then the resultant impact on human health uh, and, uh, brings upon an explosion of opportunistic diseases when living in a caloric or a calorie deficient environment. Often international aid is just a band-aid that fails to address the structural and even generational issues. That is the issue. Because so often we see a world aid back in, in uh, 1985 when we had the great concert and e the Ethiopian famine. Now Ethiopia has an abundance of moisture, but that is brought upon the locusts. And until we change the source of all of, of, of how the food is processed, where the money stays, does it stay inside the country, then we're doomed to repeat the old system, the old outcomes. All right, the Great Famine. This was a, a, a fascinating story. I'm going to try to go full screen once again, just because, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, it was a famine in Ireland. And you'd be amazed how many Irish here now in the, in the Americas had their ancestry come to North America because of this four-year event between 1845 and 1849, also called the Irish Potato Famine. It occurred in Ireland in those four years when the potato crop failed in successive years. The crop failures were caused by late blight, a disease that destroys both leaves and the edible roots of the tubers of the potato plant. The causative agent of late blight is a water mold. This Irish famine was the worst to occur in Europe uh, of the 19th century. So what had happened is we already ended up with the classes. Those in, in Japan, they were called the dirt people because they worked the dirt. Without them, everybody starved. So they were the foundation, in many ways, the most important people of society because they fed the country. But they were looked down upon because they worked in the dirt. And so this tenant farmer class, especially in the west of Ireland, struggled both to provide for themselves and supply the British market with cereal crops, wheats, barleys. Many farmers had long existed at a virtual subsistence level given the small size of their land allotments and the various hardships that the land presented for farming in some regions, meaning it just wasn't ideal to farm that crop in that location. And this is where climate and weather changes come upon us. If you are growing a crop that requires a certain number of degree days, a certain amount of warmth to bring the crop to maturity, and you have a cool July, and then an early frost come late August, some crops just don't get to maturity. I'm looking out my, my side yard, and there were hops on the neighbor's fence. Those hops never got to maturity. They were still blooming when we had a, a frost the 8th and 9th of September. Crop failure at 100%. So because it's not an annual, but a perennial, we'll do it again next year with the hope that we get enough warmth to reach maturity for that crop. So these people 
by eight, by the early 1840s, almost half the Irish population, but primarily the rural poor, the rural poor had come to depend almost exclusively on the potato for their diet. The rest of the population also consumed it in large quantities. But this heavy reliance on just one or two high yielding types of potatoes greatly reduced the genetic variety that ordinarily prevents the decimation of an entire crop by disease. And thus the Irish became vulnerable to famine. And then this strain, of, 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 of mold arrived accidentally from North America. And it was that same year that Ireland had an unusually cool, moist weather in which the blight thrived. Much of the potato crop rotted in the fields. That partial crop failure was followed by more devastating failures in 46 and 1849 as each year's potato crop was almost completely by, uh, ruined by the blight. The famine proved to, to be a watershed in the demographic history of Ireland. And the direct consequences of this famine Ireland's population of almost 8.4 million had fallen to 6.6 million just six years later. The number of agricultural laborers and small holders in the western and southwestern countries underwent an especially dramatic decline. And so this ended up as a clearinghouse of so many people uh, left Ireland. And thereafter, more land than before ended up being used for grazing sheep and cattle, providing for food. So this is where we learn when we have monoculture. And it is my sense that we, because of Western agriculture, those particular business practices have left ourselves and the following generations highly susceptible to a similar kind of issue. And when we use chemicals as we are, as a base for fertilizing rather than manure, and then also as GMO foods, we're really putting ourselves up for a repeat of what happened in Ireland. All right, the other one, four, failures, uh, weather and climate changes. Some threats can be absorbed by nearby production. You have one farmer, he loses it. You know, it's a tornado. It's a strong wind gust. It's a fire in the field after the, the weed has turned golden. But that doesn't mean it jumps to the field there or the one after. And when we have a diversity of crops and not from one end of Nebraska to the other side of Illinois, covered by corn that could be, in this example, burned from one end to the other, or the disease, the blight, the mold is carried by winds from one end to the other, then everyone's infected. When you have this patchwork, of different crops from one region to another, you have these fire breaks, which stop the intrusion of an invasion of one kind or another from jumping fields to fields. And so we are in many, many ways setting ourselves up for an epic failure. All right. While other changes are long-term and structural globally, what we need to do is be able to separate weather events from climatic events. And usually those are not visible until we get deep, deep, deep into hindsight. This is temperature. As we look at these wild swings, in fact, these lines are nearly straight up, small plateau, and then straight down. Right now, we have a, a, almost a sense of fanaticism about global warming. Look at each one of these temperature peaks. Tell me, tell me, is it a peak? or a plateau. It is an abrupt shot up, and then it is almost as quickly a, a fall back. So some regulating function inside the planet's solar system or, or whatnot is going to regulate the temperatures of this planet. The other thing that I find interesting is in these last four peaks, we can see that each of these successive peaks is lower by the better part of a full 0.6 degrees Celsius than the previous one. So the sun also is approaching the end of a cycle and isn't capable of putting out the energy that it did thousands of years ago. Now, the sun is old and there are parts of its, of its life cycle that we do not fully understand. The same is true with its relationship with earth, primarily the magnetic one. That part of it is never, never discussed. All right. After each and every peak in temperature comes a rapid and dramatic cooling. This cooling is always accompanied by drought, famine, and human migration. These periods of drought 
last centuries. Humanity thrives in warmer weather every single time. Now, there is an event, a 4.2 kilo year event, if you wanted to go look it up on Wikipedia and the other sources, is that starting around the year 2200 BC and probably the last of the entire 22nd century BC, it was hypothesized to have caused the collapse of the old kingdom in Egypt, as well as the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia and the culture, uh, the, the existing culture in the lower Yangtze River area. The drought may have been initiated by the collapse or also indicated the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization with some of its population moving southeastward to follow the movement of their desired habitat. This is the key. We follow our desired habitat, the habitat with the longest possible growing season. Warmth allows humanity to thrive every single time. All right, uh, let's look at uh, number five, the primary causes of food system failures resulting in famine, and that is a geophysical natural disaster. These events are sudden, massive events that require immediate and global, often global assistance. They do require time to recover, but usually these locations are built back to prior, built back to prior conditions, and rarely are towns and cities relocated. The 1931 uh, floods in China resulting in the deaths of 4 million people. And then uh, earlier, the 1887 Yellow River flood killing 2 million people. An earthquake in 1556 in China killing 830,000 people. Earthquake, cyclone, earthquake, typhoons, those kind of events that take the lives of six digits to seven digits worth of people. We don't move the cities because these events happen. We build back. We do it time and time again. All right, number six is sabotage. This is something that without the the presence of of Christian and, and his website, Ice Age Farmer, I probably would not be aware of. And he does a, a broadcast twice, maybe three times a week, but he is pointing out where we're seeing sabotage of farm equipment, trucks, rail lines, packaging plants, grain combines, grain silos, spontaneous combustion of these of these structures, these processes, whether they're egg plants, meat processing plants, distribution centers. This is happening globally. Now, whether it's a coincidence or an intentional internal sabotage, I'm not in a position to say. But until we stand back and look at the theme of this news, You will see these individual events making the news, but then to finally draw and put it all together, you wouldn't think it necessary. (coughs) I should have brought I should have brought water in. But what, what we're seeing is the developing of a theme. A theme that if you take a thread out of a particular tapestry, part of it unravels. Look at COVID undoing a couple of threads in this tapestry of very long supply chains, part of the tapestry comes undone. Or you need that tapestry to pull over yourself, that blanket to stay warm at night. But now there are big, big holes in that blanket, which should provide comfort, big holes that will take some time to recover from. All right. Uh, Number seven, logistics failures, primary causes for food system failures, communications. We're missing dock workers. Where did they go? Well, by golly, they were laid off in March. They migrated. They went somewhere else. They found something else to do. Class eight trucks crashed. Class eight trucks being those semis, those diesels, those lorries that travel the roads, carrying your goods from rail depots from docks on the west, east, and southern Gulf Coast. Those trucks are Class 8 trucks. That industry saw numerous bankruptcies March, April, and May. But all of a sudden, people are going back to work. Over the weekend, TSA checked a million passengers through the gates at American at, at U.S. Airlines. A million customers were getting this air traffic almost back to where we were before the pandemic. But now the workers have been let go. They've been dislocated. So we're to the point 
where we've got to reconstitute these manufacturing processes, these supply lines, but do it from a place where they have been damaged, maybe not irreparably, but to where they're not able to resupply or, or get back to the positions of strength where they were prior to the March shutdowns. So we're missing migrant labor. They're not welcome in the country because we can't test them all. And if we can't test them all because, A, we don't have a test that tests specifically for COVID, that means we have to do temperature checks. And when we find a positive person, then we've got to deal with their health care issues. But apparently not having food is too great a cost or a cost not great enough to set up the systems in place to deal with migrant labor from New Zealand to Australia to Canada, the United States to Europe and Eastern Europe, even China and Asia, all of the movement across the planet requires migrant labor, this low cost labor to do the hard work of harvesting, planting and maintaining these farms. Global governments are not being responsive enough to the needs of agricultural industry and especially the family farm. This may be the problem and it may be the solution. You would think that we could remedy these issues with the huge centralization, with the power to pull the strings of all of these industries located in one, two, in Nestle, Coke, Unilever, Dannon, Mars, Wrigley, all of these foods, you would think that they would talk. They probably do and do rather often. But with the power concentrated to manage this industry in such few hands that we could be very dynamic and reactive and anticipatory in our needs as a population. So greed and not using lessons from the past as a guide for current practices. I see is a huge weak spot. The unnecessary consolidation of production, diversity, processing, manufacturing, seed stock, our continued growing reliance on GMO strains may or will lead to catastrophic monoculture collapse of production. Corn, soy, potato, wheat, sorghum, all and uh, almonds, and others all represent the pinnacle or what we believe to be the best of each of these types of foods. Are we resilient or are we just reliant on the processes that are already in place? Is there a way around this? All right. I've got that in there, huh? All right. uh, Serious. All right. So. Nope. All right. Back to the basics. I've never had this problem with this, uh, these graphics. All right. uh, Last one. Um, Let's do this. And we're to the point where there are just so many points of failure. And with election time coming up in the States, there's another potential disruptor beginning to show up. That of uncertainty, the markets today, because On October 19th, we didn't get confirmation that there would be another round of stimulus at a minimum of $1.8 trillion introduced into the consumer's pockets to guarantee states and local governments' ability to, to make their pension payments, to continue the Paycheck Protection Plan, the PPP, to send funds back into the airlines to keep them aloft and supporting the trans uh, the, the transportation industry in this country. There are just so many points of failure and the terrifying danger of our just-in-time food delivery system where apples from Ch- apples, where grapes from Chile end up on American store shelves out of season. I'm not so old as to be able to remember when a box of oranges at Christmas time was an incredible gift. And that was something my <clears throat> my maternal grandparents always did that. Good to see you guys on. All right, we're back to CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, where we farm to table and we have to surrender the potential of citrus in winter or we build within 500 miles of consumption those processes, those greenhouses that infrastructure to where we can't grow citrus in the northern latitudes. We've become incredibly dependent on the long haul, be it over the road, over the oceans, or through the air. All three are in play in any given moment. But bringing supplies back home 
must, must be a priority for the new administration, the highest of priorities. And if it isn't, it will be imminently. The other thing is, maybe that's the agenda. Maybe that's what they have wanted all along, is to force our hand into local manufacturing, into sustainability. They're doing it in the most curious of ways. And now with the climate being the agenda to do this, maybe it's the opportunity to rework how everything is being done. Now, how they get to their goal of 500 million people, I don't know. But nonetheless, changes are afoot. And with an election at hand and already store shelves getting a bit thin, now is the time to get ready for the winter ahead. All right. Let's see. uh, If you want to know who controls you, look at who you are not allowed to criticize. We've all heard that. We've heard it a couple of times. Who and what are we not allowed to criticize? All right. Other shows on Metadime here. Coffee Break Show with Vicki Helm. Weekdays at 11 o'clock Mountain. Unlocked with uh, with Tracy Wilson. Talk about business, family, and life and the many other topics that are appropriate for the time. Uh, She runs at this time, but on alternating days from my Monday and Wednesday. And then, of course, another perspective, 6 o'clock Mountain Time, Mondays and Wednesdays. So that's uh, kind of what we have going on here. All right, we're really at uh, what seems to me an, an inflection point where uh, the second lockdown is looming. It didn't seem like I, I talked to my brother about this last month and he's like, ah, it's not, it'll never happen. Just look at the medical examples. And I'm like, I, I get that. But this isn't a medical emergency. This is a political emergency. This is driven by an agenda outside of medicine. And once we understand what that agenda may entail, all efforts at preparation should be deployed. The time approaches. All right. I'll see you on Wednesday for another perspective. I'll figure out what to talk about between now and then, but I'll let you know on the weather show tomorrow. In the meantime, have a great night. Go stock up, please. Go stock up. And then while you're out there going to the store, hey, look up. 